Okay, so good evening, everyone. How's how's everybody doing? So how was the submission yesterday? No comments. How was yeah? Was it okay? I mean the assignment. Were you able to do the Gibbs sampling uh, question? What is it? So were you guys able to do the Gibbs sampling question? So what's the what's the way to generate samples for a one dimensional X? How do you do it? <laughs> so how do you generate samples from this mixture of Gaussians? Yeah. And then that's the probability distribution. You choose one k out of it. Yeah. And then from that Gaussian, you take. Uh, I mean, sample, sample x. x. Yeah. No, but that's the generated description, right? That's like, uh, you know, how like if I didn't tell you Gibbs sampling, forget about Gibbs sampling. If that was the joint distribution of x or whatever, that's the distribution of x. Then you see that it, yeah, it's an average of a bunch of Gaussian density functions. Then you'd first get a uh, categorical distribution, basically, right? You sample from a categorical distribution. Uh, you get one of the index, and uh, corresponding to that index, some Gaussian. Just get a sample from that. That's a generative procedure. That will be your initial, the lambda and the x that you're going to get. Then sure. after that, using uh, the lambda, you generate x given lambda. X given lambda is easy. Yes. Lambda given x. Yeah. How do you get lambda given x? Is the question. Uh, <laughs> so, so basically okay. what you do is you use uh, your particular probability you calculate, I mean for uh, in your, in this equation basically of what your x1, what your yeah. x1 is, yeah. and then you take the, the lambda value also and multiply it, and then you get 10, you get 10, uh, so you're doing it for each of the k's. Yeah. So for k zero, you will take uh, what is the x given k one given k is equal to zero. Yeah. Take the prior probability, I mean the p of uh, zero k equal to zero, multiply it, and then you get a new lambda distribution. And sample from that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I guess uh, you some of you have solved it. Basically, uh, you need to be careful in terms of sampling of x given k is easy. You just uh, so x given lambda is easy, but sampling. Uh, Lambda given x, uh, there is some distribution that you need to compute. Okay, you compute uh, lambda is equal to one, lambda is equal to two, lambda is equal to ten, right? Uh, there are ten different values. You need to find those values uh, given the previous x, and then sample from that. Okay, that's the Gibbs sampling part. So you have to use uh, previous x to get the new lambda, get a sample for lambda. Given the current lambda, get the new x, use that x to get the next lambda, and so on. So that's the so the rest of the questions fine. Uh, any difficulty? I mean, this is going to be part of your exam, so eventually. <laughs> so if you're comfortable with it, that's good. Uh, if not, then ask me questions during the office hours or or, or the TA. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's fine. I think. Uh, So you're saying the distribution G. Yes, 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 yes. That's true. Why? I mean, so, sure, things going to cancel, but you know X, you know X, X prime. So. I mean, it's just that you're saying that G of, uh, you know, this G function given this conditional probability function may not be symmetric, like Gaussian is symmetric, but uh, in general, it may not be symmetric, then it's fine. You can evaluate the, the, as long as you can evaluate the density function, then it's fine. Yeah, there'll be additional terms here. And first of all, I mean, this is a computational procedure. We have not said uh, 
I know, I think in the class we discussed, okay, Gibbs sampling corresponds to a Marco, you know, this, uh, uh, the transition probability may, you know, function of a Marco, a suitable Marco chain whose stationary distribution is the target distribution, whatever, P of X, right? Um, so, sorry, pi of X. But uh, we haven't seen that for Metropolis Hastings. Uh, in the sense, it also eventually will get you samples from the target distribution. Uh, but uh, a lot of people do research on building better, uh, better transition probability distributions, okay? Better sampling procedures, not just Metropolis Hastings. It's, it's old. Uh, if you look at pi MC, the link on the Silvers page, it has lots of different samplers, okay? So you may want to look at its documentation to get a feel for, you know, there is something to be created, you know? It's not, it's not the end of uh, line. People are still de developing new samplers for different applications, okay? And there's a huge intersection of this with uh, a lot of experimental physics, uh, physics, statistical mechanics uh, area. Okay. Uh, so if no questions about that, then we'll get to today's uh, topic soon. Uh, but what we're doing now is transition from two huge areas, deep learning and graphical models. You know, they're uh, full courses on their own right, but uh, we have kind of covered uh, key ingredients. You know, the basics are transferable across topics, uh, and we've looked at some key ingredients in both topics, okay? Uh, so the next three lectures uh, would be, uh, I mean, today's lecture about online learning in general, like just appreciating, you know, what's the difference between online learning and me just solving a supervised learning problem again and again. Um, that's the topic of today. And then we look at uh, what is called reinforcement learning um, in the next lecture. And, uh, and deep reinforcement learning where it comes back full circle and talks about using deep network architectures that you learned in the first six lectures intersection uh, ideas from reinforcement learning uh, to create uh, things like, uh, I guess now it's alpha zero, but uh, we're gonna discuss only alpha go zero. So uh, architectures which are able to play really good games, you know, hopefully things uh, which can solve really good decision-making problems, okay. So that's the, um, I guess the route that we're gonna take for the next three lectures. Uh, so let's look at what we're gonna do today, okay. So today we're going to look at, uh, you know, ultimately at the end of the lecture, you want to kind of appreciate you know, what is what is online learning and how is it different from supervised learning, okay? So if you don't know online learning, you can always do supervised learning again and again. So that's fine, okay? So, uh, and then we look at uh, some relations between, uh, so we'll kind of, today's lecture is a little bit different in the sense that uh, people who are just exposed to forecasting methods and, uh, just unsupervised and supervised learning. Uh, we're gonna kind of interchangeably now talk about uh, decision making now. So like your action, so your labeling. So previously we just had labels, right? You're gonna predict uh, loan or no loan or predict there's gonna be rain tomorrow or not, or there's a cat in the figure picture or not. But here we're gonna take decisions like, uh, okay, order X units of uh, certain, uh, you know, SKU uh, in my inventory, right? So you're gonna make that ordering decision, you know, purchase X quantities of some SK, you know, SKU in, uh, in an inventory management problem, or, you know, if it's self-driving, you know, take a certain decision, you know, steer left, steer right, or, you know, take a braking action or something like that. So there's gonna be labels are now just, we're gonna kind of not think too much about labeling, but think about actions. So directly from features to actions is kind of the idea. So actions can be rich, right? So they, they are not just labels. Uh, so you need to understand or appreciate like uh, what's what's the difference, what's what's new here. Uh, the third aspect would be what are called uh, bandit algorithms or or certain simple sequential decision making problems where you care about uh, learning, as in learning something about uh, the environment. Uh, for example, uh, like what's the demand for my products? You know, I have three products I'm selling every day. Uh, you know, you want to learn what's the demand for each of my products. Then I can, of course, stock my inventory levels to very high levels and see the demand every day. And then maybe I can estimate uh, what's the demand as a function of weather or whatever. But I also want to earn money, right? I can't just sit and uh, order a lot of inventory and uh, just look at demand, okay? I can, if, I invent, if I order too much inventory, it doesn't get sold, then I incur losses. So I need to take into account my decisions uh, uh, you know, make money as well as uh, learn, okay? So there's gonna be this, uh, there's not gonna be a separate distinction of first learn something and then 
take decisions like uh, for example you could always build a forecasting model and then take a decision but uh, the style of online learning would be that you will try to learn enough so that you can actually take decisions uh, simultaneously so that's where that's going to be a leap or a different slightly different something different from regular supervised learning okay and the last part is going to be uh, contextual bandits which are still you know which actually take into account uh, features okay so actually the third bullet point is about forget about features i just make predictions for example tomorrow okay it's going to rain or not uh, and how is it going to influence my and i get some feedback on i predicted rain there's no rain so i'm going to get feedback and based on that i'm going to hopefully do do better decisions uh, but the last part is just combining you know uh, saying okay now you have features go from features to decisions okay so even without features the problem is interesting so that's the third bullet point and with features that's that's like the usual supervised learning uh, type of thinking but now you are you, are, you don't have labels you have uh, actions okay so is the lay of the land clear and then uh, you will see that uh, contextual bandits or whatever the last bullet point is a special case of uh, the general problem of reinforcement learning which which will be the context of uh, next uh, next lecture okay so uh, let's go here this my okay i think i put it in my pocket Yeah, I don't know which color I want to choose. Okay, let's just. Um, okay, so we looked at, as, as I said, we looked at two things: deep learning and graphical models, and uh, they're basically about prediction, right? The, oops, that was not the intention. So they are about prediction, ideally. I mean, they are also about uh, you know learning latent variables, learning parameters of a model, and so on. So they are also useful for inference. Um, we very quickly discussed about decisions, right? So we said ultimately you you build forecasting models to make good decisions, especially in a business context. That's the goal, right? It's uh, uh, we want to make uh, decisions which get more revenue or you know whatever social welfare, uh, you know some surplus that you want to capture. So uh, and uh, if you are taking just a one-shot decision, you can build a you know elaborate prediction model. And if you're just taking a decision, but you don't, you're not incorporating that the the performance of the decision back into uh, you know the next decision that you're going to take. Then it's like uh, whatever you learned so far is enough, right? You build some very interesting model, get low validation error uh, scores, use that to forecast something or you know predict something like demand or whatever. And uh, then just take decisions because there's no loop closing that closing back to how bad you took a decision to uh, what you can do next day next time. Okay, uh, but now if you have a feedback loop, so this is called I guess closed loop uh, setting, where you take a decision, you also get a feedback on how well you did. Okay, uh, so maybe you made bad inventory decisions. There were lost sales or you know surplus inventory lying around uh, in that season. Let's say you're a clothing retailer. Then you know that okay, maybe I estimated my demand really bad. I need to go back to my drawing board and figure out better forecasting, uh, you know, uh, models. So so that's when there is feedback. Then uh, uh, it it becomes interesting to learn, you know, how to take better decisions over time. Okay. So I said today is we're going to look at online machine learning or online learning is what uh, discipline uh, sub area is called, um, and then we look at uh, RL and uh, uh, deep learning version of RL. Okay, so for the first, I guess five five minutes or so, or ten minutes or so, I'm gonna just motivate. What are these decision problems? You know, I've been kind of using some terms uh, in the past few minutes. So let's look at uh, you know, let's look at a couple of key problems. Uh, some of you have done revenue management, right? So are doing revenue management, or I've already done it. How many of you have done revenue management? Okay, so you probably know many of the decision making problems. News vendor problem and stuff like that, right? So for those of you who have not done revenue management, uh, uh, just think of inventory management as just uh, you're you're a retailer or you know uh, somebody who needs to make sales, and uh, you you maintain inventory levels of uh, products. So you sometimes have to even order products in advance in time so that you actually get the products on the day you want to make the sale. 
and uh, and then you order some number of units and then you see how many things got sold and uh, and hopefully the reward is uh, things that you sold and the cost was the cost of ordering those items so some some you know you spend some money so the margin difference is probably your profit okay and uh, take another example routing problem it's a it's a for example think of a transportation setting so you are you are operating a fleet of uh, trucks and uh, you want to distribute uh, inventory uh, that you're getting from manufacturers to maybe warehouses uh, then you want to figure out which trucks go which truck goes where uh, trying to minimize you know your uh, expenses right your fuel is very expensive you know unlike cars trucks consume a lot more fuel um, and you also want to don't want trucks trucks tra travel long, long distances like across the us for example so you want to take into account uh, such issues while optimally figuring out which truck should pick up which you know you know products from which manufacturers and go to which warehouses okay so it's a huge uh, industry actually maybe let me see if i remember 700 billion dollars or maybe more than a trillion so it's a huge industry okay um, so anyway these are complex decisions and in fact even if you know everything about uh, what's going to happen in the future as in what's the demand going to be what's uh, uh, what's the cost of doing action a action b still figuring out the optimal action is uh, hard in the sense of computationally hard so there is this computational challenge of of making complex decisions uh, people have done computer science uh, you have heard of computational complexity right things are polynomial time or np hard and stuff like that so for example routing problems generally are np hard same thing with even inventory management and resource allocation so generally these problems are hard to compute by themselves even if you know every all even if you have all data you know even if you have made good forecasting um, they are still difficult to compute okay anyway so so that's complex decisions. Uh, here is a snapshot of, uh, uh, I think uh, now it's two years ago, uh, March or April of 2017. Uh, so, so MIT Tech Review is just a is a is a magazine, and uh, they come out with uh, top 10 uh, breakthrough technologies every year. Uh, so here's uh, reinforcement learning at the bottom. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I think next year, the year in 2018, also they had RL and maybe something else. I think GANs. GANs we studied uh, uh, four lectures ago, right? Five lectures ago. So GANs was one of the breakthrough technologies uh, in 2018. I haven't seen 2019 yet. Maybe they released something. Uh, so RL is a way to kind of address uh, decision making. Okay. So this is just a uh, it's not. It's, it's a little bit disconnected from the previous slide, but R is a way to make uh, decisions, these complex decisions, uh, while you don't know anything about uh, the demands and things like that. So it's a more difficult problem. So even if you know everything about the demand, the problem can be computationally hard. That was the previous slide, I guess. Uh, this slide, I'm just saying that R is a way to attack a problem, attack the problem when you don't even know the data going into your decisions. Okay. Um, anyway, so. It has seen some successes in very, uh, I guess, uh, stylized environments, uh, which even, which were even difficult, and uh, people would not have thought about this uh, five years ago. Okay, so for example, uh, there is this uh, uh, algorithm called uh, DQN or Deep Q Network. Okay, so it could solve uh, almost, you know, all the all the games in Atari. Uh, um, 2600 I guess this is the set of Atari games 50 or 48 Atari games these are just uh, video games right so you, many of you have probably played uh, these types of video games I don't know if this generation has played uh, these, these 2d games but uh, has anybody played uh, Atari games before <laughs> okay few of few people okay so just think of uh, you know playing any of the games do any of you play video games Okay, so have you been following? So, so Atari games uh, were something that DQN could solve, you know, really well and compare, you know, do well with compared to human performance. So, ha have you heard of Dota? Okay, so like uh, there's this company. <laughs> so, this company or organization called OpenAI. Uh, so, they were trying to uh, create, a, you know, a software to play Dota against real, you know, professional game players. Okay, professional teams and uh, they have had some a little bit of success and kind of the principles behind that that you know that publicity or PR 
stuff that happened uh, a year ago uh, is basically the stuff uh, you know related to reinforcement learning. Okay. Um, and actually, you can actually play things like Quake or any of the you know uh, Unity-based games. Uh, you can actually interface them with software, which can play, which can explore the environment and learn to play. Okay. Uh, anyway, so so that's so that's how it started. So five years ago, there was really no uh, way to do these on games. Okay, on maybe Tetris. So how many of you know the game of Tetris? So you kind of put blocks together and they vanish, and then you get scores. You know, high scores, yeah. maybe. <laughs> Uh, so, people had, uh, you know, uh, were designing algorithms to learn to play games, okay? Because there it's decisions, right? You need to figure out where to, you know, what action to take in a timely manner to maximize your score. Uh, but uh, up till, uh, until five years ago, people were not able to uh, get algorithms or software to, uh, which are not rule based, okay? Uh, it's actually data driven uh, to actually play these games. And uh, in the previous slide, uh, they made a breakthrough with uh, Atari games, essentially. Uh, culmination of maybe 30 years of research uh, across the whole research uh, community. And this is another breakthrough by, I guess, uh, Google or DeepMind, uh, um, which was uh, which used a lot of computational resources to uh, figure out what is the best, uh, you know, figure out how to play the game of Go. So how many of you have heard of game of Go? Okay, Go is a board game like, uh, you know, it's a board game, I guess, like chess, but Unlike chess, there's a lot of different rules, right? I mean, um, so we'll discuss this maybe two lectures from now when we talk about deep reinforcement learning. Uh, but uh, so a company, I guess DeepMind in this case, uh, was able to design a software which was able to compete with a re you know human player. And uh, I don't know if you guys were born, but uh, in in late '90s there was this uh, IBM. Uh, I forget the name of the you know machine which was able to beat. Uh, Gary Castro in the game of chess, right? So, um, so these are like uh, milestones which uh, software has, uh, have achieved. And in the game of Go, uh, it's just if you think of it from a purely computational perspective, there's a huge branching factor. Okay, the computer has to explore too many things to figure out what is the next thing to do. Whereas humans, you know, they learn and they have uh, awesome thing called brain, so they actually uh, can figure out. Uh, <laughs> What the ne what the next move is without figuring out without ex you know doing something dumb okay anyway uh, so given that motivation uh, we'll take some baby steps and just learn about uh, uh, how to mix uh, decision making into with forecasting okay that's going to be kind of the theme for today and so we will look at uh, so actually I'm going to again motivate online machine learning through an example through an application. And then we look at uh, increasing, increasingly difficult or increasingly interesting uh, techniques, okay? Starting from A-B testing, uh, then multi on bandits, and then contextual bandits. So online machine learning. So, so what is, so we, this is just a name for some setup, okay? Some particular pattern that you observe. If, you, if your uh, workflow of your, if your task in a company uh, resembles this pattern, maybe you're actually doing online machine learning, okay? Uh, what is the pattern? So the pattern is the machine or you uh, observe the state of the world, okay? And state of the world just means measurements, like a feature vector, essentially, okay? Uh, which is called the context. So you optionally can observe something about the environment. Maybe you don't observe anything. That's also possible, okay? You don't, maybe not, you can't make measurements. And then you choose an action, okay? This is like labeling, but it's richer than that. So you choose, choose an action, okay? Maybe uh, tomorrow I bet on uh, IBM stock, or uh, you know I bet on Tesla stock. That's an action, okay? And uh, you obtain feedback on the chosen action, okay? Maybe the stock price went up or low, uh, went down, right? So that's the feedback for that action. So number two and number three are critical, and number one is optional. You maybe you can make measurement. You can look at historical price graphs to actually figure out what bet you want to make, okay? And then you repeat it every day. Um, and your goal is to optimize uh, feedback, as in optimize, like your feedback could be, okay, you, you won, you made some money, okay? So then your goal is to, of course, maximize uh, the money you're making, you know, for the chosen action. So there's some actions that you're choosing over maybe 10 days or maybe over the next year, and hopefully those actions are optimizing for the feedback, because that's the only way you're figuring out whether the action was good or not, okay? 
and uh, at least for today's uh, lecture uh, this is going to be kind of an assumption that we'll we'll make and we'll revisit this again and again which is that uh, our actions uh, will not influence uh, what what i'll see tomorrow okay for example if i buy tesla stock uh, for a thousand dollars it's not going to influence uh, the rest of the market okay but if uh, you know some you know billionaire is going to buy a tesla stock in large quantities that's going to move the market okay <laughs> so there's a so the context which is uh, you know measurements that you make uh, they are not going to get influenced by what action you took today you know tomorrow's measurements will not get influenced by to today's actions but that's not always true right i mean for example um, like if i uh, stock less you know for example in an inventory management system if i uh, put very few inventory out for sale uh, maybe i lose sales but also consumers kind of see that yeah this person will will always be out of stock they stop coming next you know next time they want to shop okay so there is an impact of me taking a low inventory decisions today on the context that i see uh, tomorrow or the next month or the next season okay so there is there are examples like that but uh, in fact that's more general and probably more common but we'll just assume that uh, we don't have an influence on what you know we don't have a big influence on the world okay or pretty much no influence on the world um and so here's an example uh, this is uh how many of you have heard of msn.com <laughs> do you know there's a company called microsoft okay so they have this uh, website uh, uh, called msn uh, msn.com uh, it's like i guess yahoo or one of these uh, reddit for one of these places um, so basically it's a it's a it's like an online tabloid right so it's a, it's a collection of articles information uh, which people want to generally consume okay and uh, you want to personalize uh, the page that people as you know that that you're showing uh, to the user okay uh, because you want to increase some sort of a measurement uh, like uh, your your action is going to be how do how do i configure this page what to show and uh, your feedback is going to be how long did they spend time on this page uh, what clicks did they make were they valuable clicks maybe going to you know uh, buy a car or something like that versus um, something else buy a book right um so the loop is users arrive uh, they come with their browsing history uh, user account maybe and previous visits and uh, then the company uh, chooses uh, things to show right and the user responds with uh, you know by interacting with the content uh, you know how long did they stay on the page uh, or you know sub pages next pages uh, clicks navigation etc right and our goal is to choose uh, content so as to yield some behavior some metric you know and this is not very simple problem actually there are several teams in uh, microsoft to actually Uh, figure out what is the right KPI, uh, or what what is the right uh, measurement uh, that we want to optimize for, and uh, the assumption, as as I was telling about the previous slide, is that recommendations to one user do not affect uh, other users. Okay, uh, today I, I recommended badly to some user, it's not going to influence uh, you know the other users that I'm going to see in the next second, next two seconds, next three seconds, or even tomorrow. Okay, because uh, maybe I have tons of users and they don't talk to each other. Maybe, okay. Um, so pictorially we have a feature vector corresponding to demographics history and then there could also be feature vectors corresponding to uh, articles you know the things that i want to place in that page and uh, hopefully there's going to be a block which will figure out you know what to show okay um, and then i'll i'll come back to the what to show but uh, and then on the uh, sorry browser uh, you the user interacts with that uh, what was shown in in a, in a certain way and then you kind of see you can you log the measurement okay how long did they spend on article a where was the mouse and so on okay um but here itself you can see you know there's a little bit of uh, non triviality if you want to just use supervised learning so you have features which is the context okay but going from context to uh, a rank list of items is uh, seems a little bit uh, already a little bit messy okay one thing you can do is okay given the feature vector you can uh, maybe build a binary prediction model okay what's the probability they'll click, click uh, first you know first uh, article 50 articles i have right uh, let's say uh, then i can find what is the probability they'll click the click the first article what's the probability they'll click the second article what's the probability they click the 50th article i'll get all these probabilities right that's a logical regression 
I can order those regression, I, I can order those probabilities, I get some ranked list. And then maybe those are the 50, you know, I can, and then I can show a list of these articles according to the pro propensity of clicking, okay. That's one way, but um, still, I mean, so there's a particular configuration, right? So which article appears where? So there's a lot of, so the action space is rich. I mean, it's, uh, okay, list is fine. You can probably do it in the way I mentioned, you're building separate models and uh, order things. Uh, but that's post-processing of a fore forecasting model, essentially, uh, several forecasting models. Uh, but you can see that the action space is rich, and maybe uh, regular supervised learning may not be able to uh, deal with this. So you need to put some thought on uh, when your actions are not just uh, simple labels, okay? Maybe they are a little bit more nuanced labels, okay? And uh, for this particular uh, example, uh, at, at that time, which is in 2016, three years ago, uh, they had, you know, in terms of what they reported, they had ten, tens of millions of users and uh, thousands of requests per second. And uh, they wanted to, so, so uh, they wanted to deploy like different ways, different ML, so the block that I, I guess I kind of did not talk about, which is going to be the context of today's uh, lecture. Um, hopefully it doesn't consume too much overhead, you know, it, it, like if you want to load the page in 100 milliseconds, uh, this particular block should not take, uh, you know, ha may have a budget. It, ha it should do all its computation in maybe 50 milliseconds, okay. So, um, but, you know, they were trying to s upsell their solution, which would consume only 5% more than usual. And uh, they have, you know, you know, since it's a forecasting model, it goes from features to um, some rank list, you know, you need to have some training potentially. And so they had some servers for training and they would update the model you know, the model which should do the forecasting in real time, maybe every five minutes or so, okay? So that's one way to implement an online machine learning pipeline, right? So you are training something offline, plug it into the actual production system every five minutes, and uh, that thing will take care of making predictions for everybody who arrives in that in those five minutes uh, in a static way, okay? The model is not changing there. It's changing every five minutes, okay? And uh, for the solution that they deployed, uh, which took 5% more time or whatever, overhead, uh, they could, you know, they report like, a, you know, increase in a metric that they, they want to dis disclose, which is uh, increase in clicks, okay? But this may not be the only metric. You may care about engagement or, you know, like how long did they stay on the page and so on. But uh, they, they report like 25% more click, uh, clicks. And, uh, and so what is that? So hopefully this uh, this tells you that there is something intelligent that you can do uh, over here. Uh, they then uh, naively like let's say doing log logic regression and uh, ranking uh, you know ranking probabilities and so on. So that's fine, but uh, let's see what what else we can do. Okay, that's going to be actually we'll cover this towards the end of this lecture, but uh, hopefully that's the motivation. And here I'm just listing a few other. Um, applications, mostly recommendation, personalization is seems like the um, application here, but you can think of other things like uh, churn prevention, uh, UI personalization, things like that. And, uh, and, and we have to now have, we need to have a block which takes feature vectors or context and produces actions rather than just labels, okay? Action seems to be richer. And uh, and we'll try to get there in, in phases. First, we'll talk about A-B testing, then something else, and then eventually contextual bandits, uh, which kind of uh, is the type of thing that they implement here. Any questions so far? Okay. So, okay, this material is kind of light. So, uh, so let's jump to A-B testing. So how many of you have uh, formally seen A-B testing before in a classroom environment? So where did you see it? <laughs> 570? Not in one of the courses here? Okay. What about, who's, who else has seen A-B testing? Online customer analytics? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so how many of you have not seen or haven't heard? I mean, okay, not seen, but you have heard of A-B testing somewhere. Okay. Okay, so uh, let me motivate it and then uh, Kind of tell you some some story, and it's not really complicated. But and we'll also not get into the details of all the details of A/B testing. But let's see. Uh, so you know you have a typical business scenario, or this is not really a business scenario. Any project, uh, you know, 
uh, any consulting type of uh, project or anything like that, uh, you know, you'll have a meeting, right, to decide uh, what's what's the roadmap, and uh, maybe there there are competing ideas, and uh, sometimes you're not clear on which idea to go with, and and if it's really that difficult to figure out which is going to impact your revenue or make money for you, uh, then you could potentially go with A/B testing, where you implement both, deploy both on a small uh, subpopulation of your market, and figure out which one is good. Okay, so you actually really ask. Uh, literally uh, test it out in your market and figure out which one is a good option okay so that's uh, so ab testing just corresponds to if you're having uh, two options or more than two options and figuring out uh, which option is a good which option is the best one uh, by really testing out in the market okay so they're full company full time companies actually uh, uh, optimizely so every time you so many of the web properties that you visit right many of the web pages if you look at the uh, scripts being loaded in addition to tracking scripts there are scripts which uh, which are like based from optimizely opt optimize, uh, which will actually do A/B testing in real time uh, for that web property, like any any like uh, website that you go. Okay, and uh, they are also extensively used by all the tech companies. Many of the tech companies that are listed here uh, for most of the things that like the moment you are spending time on uh, like uh, Bing's uh, search page or you know Amazon's page or you know Airbnb, they they are doing A/B testing without you knowing that you are getting tested. Okay, I mean you are part of a testing experiment. Uh, they are doing tests. Okay, uh, and especially it's important. Uh, to, so it's important because you know these are consumer-facing uh, um, services, so they really want to understand uh, what clicks for the customer. Okay, so and historically, uh, and a completely different orthogonal market is the market of clinical trials, where you want to test the uh, um, quality or the effectiveness of a drug. Uh, so these are really trials where you test it out on on humans, for example, and so uh, it's pretty expensive. But if when you do that, you actually are doing A/B testing, okay, um, or randomized control trials, actually. So, so here's a I guess a one minute fun question. So, which page is a higher conversion rate? Okay, so those who have already seen this don't answer, but. Uh, so there are two pages, you know. There's literally no difference except for one page has a coupon. Enter this coupon, enter a coupon code or something, and uh, they want to know which one will lead to higher conversion. So they don't know in the team meeting. They didn't. They don't know, or they have some hypothesis, but they 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 don't know. So they test it out in the market. Okay. So which one will have a higher conversion rate? A. So how many of you go with A? I see five or six people. Yeah. Who? How many of you think uh, B? Maybe. Fine. Okay, five, six people. How many think it doesn't make it? It's, it's not a big deal, right? Uh, they almost all look the same except one additional column, one additional field to fill, right? How many of you think there's no difference? So everybody thinks there's, okay, you think there's no difference. <laughs> okay. So anyway, that's the thing, right? They couldn't guess it, so they deployed it probably. Um, so with site B, <laughs> sorry, with option B, uh, they lost 90% of the revenue because people kind of navigate away and try to search for coupon codes. Okay, I don't know if you've done this, but whenever you see a coupon code uh, entry, then you literally open another tab and like <laughs> search for coupon codes, right? Uh, so anyway, so this, this I guess for this, they did not have to probably A-B test, but um, yeah, so so this is just an example. So here they wanted to know something and they tried it out on population, on, on, the, on their market, so their customers, and uh, figured out what the, What's what what the right thing to do is, okay. Um, so it's really not online, okay. So it's not an online uh, setting in a sense that I'm making decision. I'm not making decisions. So I know I have two decisions to two decisions to make A or B, okay. That's my decision, right? But I'm not gonna revise my decision uh, as a, as a function of like one user, next user, and so on. So I'm gonna. I just don't know which decision to make. So I'll try out both decisions for some elongated period of time. So it's not like uh, it's not really online uh, in in some sense. Okay, I'm not revising my decisions. There's no feedback loop and uh, changing some decisions potentially next time. Okay. Um, but what we'll do is we'll collect aggregate feedback. Okay, aggregate feedback over the end of a period. So maybe I showed the first site A to 100 people and site B to 100 people. Uh, I'll have uh, conversion rates for both of them and. Uh, they'll be used to decide uh, on, on what to do, basically. 
okay, whether to show A or B. Uh, here, for example, if we just track conversion rate over 100 people, conversion rate over 100 people, then you know maybe it's uh, you know 90% difference between relative difference between those two, and then you know what to do. Okay, so that's the setup. That's the setup, and. Uh, I mean, just diagrammatically. So, 100% of the users, and 50% uh, of the users are sent to what is called a control. I guess the A, a choice or control, it doesn't matter. And 50% of the users are sent to the choice B. And uh, then you just look at, uh, uh, you you just keep track of what happened. And at the end of the day, you kind of make a policy, make a decision. And this has to be a little bit more formal, made more formal, uh, which is that two things. How do you make decisions? It's going to be based on uh, the whole framework of hypothesis testing. Okay, so that's that's a that's a little bit uh, I guess uh, uh, formality there. And how do you split users? Uh, there's a particular way to split users. In per, in in fact, they're supposed to split users without knowing their uh, uh, without being uh, biased about how to split without being biased about. Um, like without being preferential about uh, sending a user to A or B, okay? So, I wouldn't say, so don't worry about the best part. So collect outcomes, and uh, there's a way to establish a cause and effect relationship. So you cause, you change something, like the added a coupon code, and uh, since I'm splitting users at random, uh, there's hopefully no variation across users, and so, uh, you can uh, attribute the loss in conversion to adding that coupon code uh, box. Okay, so what? So why are we doing this operationally, right? Why are we splitting users 50/50 at random? Ideally, we would we would we would want to imagine two different parallel worlds, parallel worlds with the same guy interacting with the first user, the first website A option, and the same guy interacting with the B option. Not sequentially, it's parallelly in two different worlds. Okay, ideally, you want to do that, but you can't get the same person to do two different things because they'll remember what they did, right? Uh, we'll have to do sequentially and so on. So that's why we are doing uh, this random splitting of users, okay? Uh, and, and so the random splitting is to ensure that the attributes of the users across the two two sets of users who saw uh, option A and option B, their uh, statistics are the same. Their features or covariates or the preferences, everything is almost the same, okay? Um, yeah, and I cut and I cut out best because Sometimes it's not the right thing to do, uh, which is coming out. You know, over the past ten years, people have been looking at what's the best way to measure cause-effect relationships. There's a whole, I guess, uh, field of causal inference, and uh, in some, uh, I guess, corner cases, uh, this this way of A/B testing, randomly splitting users and measuring the causal effect is not uh, uh, is not optimal. Okay, is not the right thing to do. Okay, that's why I guess cut out best. But that's a, I guess, a research or a second order question. Uh, Okay, so as I said, randomized uh, assignment is to eliminate biases and uh, uh, what is called confounding. Okay, so where I said uh, preferentially, like if I know that a patient is extremely sick, uh, then I don't I don't know whether the drug is going to affect them or not. So I'll just put them in uh, uh, control. And the patient is not too extremely sick, maybe I'll give them drug. That's preferential, right? That's going to completely lopsidedly say that the drug is good, where in, in in case it may not be. Okay, so th that's what I'm saying. Uh, that's what uh, randomized uh, uh, splitting may help. And uh, let's say each group has a true mean effect, which means uh, uh, the you know the conversion rate, you know some number between zero to one, let's say, uh, is uh, mu one and mu two, which is the true value for the two options, first option and second option. Then you know the hypothesis testing question would be whether uh, mu one is equal to mu two, or it's not. Okay, mu one is not equal to mu two. Okay, this is. So these are the two possible things that could, you know, uh, that could be. And given data that you've collected, uh, you just want to figure out which one is, you know, whether you can uh, reject the null or not. Okay. And uh, yeah. And uh, also in A/B testing, you're not supposed to uh, make this like a, like a testing decision or um, infer about which one is good. Uh, by peeking at the data, which means that you are so. What happens is, given given what you want to check, whether the mean effects are the same. In this case, mu one is equal to mu two, or mu one not equal to mu two. Given that, uh, you predecide on how many users 
are going to be exposed to uh, I guess A and B okay and you wait you do not check the data essentially uh, till you actually hit those number of users and then you kind of do the hypothesis test whatever that is okay and uh, and then you report your results you can reject the null that the um, two two effects are not the same in the sense one of them is greater than the other or in this case different from the other or you cannot reject the null it could be the same okay so why this uh, why are you not supposed to look at the numbers is uh, then your statistical estimation uh, so the assumptions made in hypothesis testing kind of break down so the there's something called the power of the test and uh, making incorrect inferences when something is true so those those calculations all get messed up okay so 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 people have figured out how to have uh, valid what are called p values or statistics uh, even if you peek peek at the data okay but the, that comes under i guess research or more advanced techniques okay but here you're not supposed to you're pre deciding how many users to show and then you you show it to those many number of users and then decide something okay uh, there are different types of hypothesis tests based on uh, different i guess schools um, like let's you know and all of them are kind of trying to you know for example in fisher you you know you would have a, a null hypothesis h not and you would try to reject uh, sorry uh, reject the null or uh, not reject the null okay that's all you can do you cannot just accept the alternate okay so that's not the word i mean that's i guess um, you you're not going to accept an alternative because uh, of some because of some statistic uh, you just can reject the null, uh, which is that there is no difference between uh, the two options, or uh, you can reject the null that there is some difference, but uh, uh, you don't know what that is. Okay, and uh, these these two are more familiar to us because we can we just saw a lot of a lot of our graphical models and conditional probabilities. So here, under the null, you can find out what is the propensity of what is the probability that I could I observe this data, which is essentially the likelihood, right? Under the null, under some model, null. Just think of null as a model and uh, alternate as a model under each model i can find the probability of uh, the evidence which is the data that i collected okay of of my experiment uh, and i can compare in 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 this case i can compare i can compute what is called likelihood ratio and if it crosses the threshold then uh, i prefer uh, i think the model 1 is good or i model 1 model 0 is good whatever okay and uh, the base and twist to that is you can you include both uh, Sorry, include uh, priors. Okay, prior beliefs about null and uh, uh, the alternate hypothesis. Okay, or in this case, model one and model model zero and model one. Okay. Uh, we'll not really go into the details of hypothesis testing. How many of you have? I mean, you must have seen hypothesis testing in 570, 570 right? Um, how many of you remember hypothesis testing? <laughs> okay, many of you remember. It's actually uh, so when you do regression and stuff, sometimes you report uh, significance values and so on. They could be erroneous, by the way. I think I, I kind of uh, mentioned this in my 575 class, uh, but uh, uh, so th th this is kind of in the same family of things. Okay, so actually, what you do, I don't know if I discussed this, uh, but you do uh, two sample testing. Okay, two sample t tests and things like that. Any questions about A/B testing? So we just spe specialized. Uh, we just said. Uh, this is important, and then this part is hypothesis testing. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes, yes. So, so there, so. The question is, he's saying, uh, okay, we don't really do randomized, fully randomized. We, we kind of choose the audience and then test, uh, test, uh, you know, multiple options uh, against them. So the the whole testing could be uh, specific to a subpopulation. It could be for, you know, like uh, teenagers. It could be for working professionals. It's fine. It's not doesn't have to be the whole market that you're covering. So it's fine. So for a given subpopulation, you are not supposed to further fragment it. I mean. This randomization, random splitting is only to ensure that uh, you're not correlating who you're applying treatment and control, or in this case, B and A, based on their covariates or based on their features. That's all. But once you are restricting yourself to some subpopulation, sub within that, you're supposed to not now prefer, uh, you know, certain type of teenagers versus some other type of teenagers. That's all. Any other question? So if you have questions about optimizely, just ask him. <laughs> 
Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So. So it's it's kind of uh, highly used in the industry actually. So when I uh, mentioned uh, companies like uh, I guess, I mean when I said Microsoft, uh, Microsoft and Bing, you know, on the search page, you know, how how to position the results, how many results to show, you know, what's the speed of the results to show, where should they be, you know, should there be ads next to it, how many ads should there be? It's, there's hundred different questions that they uh, they have uh, because you know a search page is visited by millions of people each day. Uh, so they, they, pro I think they have a huge, uh, they have a huge web page of all the learnings that they did uh, over the past 10, 15, 20 years on A/B testing at uh, at web scale or internet scale. Okay, um, and it need not be a one-time process. So the, every time you have a split, you know, two roads to take, you're not sure which road to take. You can uh, run an A/B test. Uh, just as long as you do it in a statistically valid way, then this is a good procedure. Uh, because it's essentially a field experiment, right? You're literally, literally testing it on the audience where where money is, right? You test it out on a portion of the audience, and hopefully you figure out which one is good, and then you deploy it for your full audience. Okay. So that's the those are the pros, and uh, there are lots of cons. For example, um, uh, this is what I was saying that, uh, for example, this is a list of issues that affect uh, online uh, that that affect A/B testing, uh, especially ensuring that the two populations that this the the two populations that that see the first option and second option, ensuring that they are almost the same, is pretty difficult because you know users just come online in, in an online fashion, as in sequentially, and you don't know how to control it, right? How do you control that the attributes of so each user comes with a user profile, you assign the first five profiles to option A. Uh, and if the next five profiles don't fit to option B, then you are in, in a bad situation because now uh, you know you have lopsided uh, assignments, right? So there are some optimization problems related to that, and uh, and also it's uh, it could be wasteful. Okay, so that's going to be the uh, segue to the next part, uh, which is that uh, if you spend like if you're doing clinical trial uh, for a drug for an efficacy for a drug. And if you have thousand patients enrolled, and uh, which means that maybe you'll put 500 on uh, control and 500 on the drug, okay? So you already know maybe by the 20th, uh, you know, by the 20th or the 30th uh, observations and 30 patients, you know, 30 patients on each side, maybe you are already seeing, uh, you know, that the drug is not effective, okay? Or maybe the drug is really effective, okay? So if the drug is really effective, then you know, giving no treatment to uh, pe the control people is probably bad. They're gonna maybe uh, you know have more fatal issues uh, if you don't get, administer the drug. Okay, so you want to kind of judiciously use the samples. Okay, samples as in these users, the thousand users. Whereas, where ultimately what you want to achieve is that if the drug is really effective, then maybe by uh, out of the thousand uh, patients, um, you could take online decisions of how to what to do for each patient sequentially such that maybe you, you expose 800 patients to the drug and uh, maybe 200 patients to the control okay so that's that's in a way uh, being efficient okay uh, you're still consuming a thousand you know you're still exposing you know you're do still doing the experiment thousand people but you are now interested in uh, something else some other objective as well not just figuring out the efficacy of the drug but also to ensure that uh, more patients, uh, you know, I have less regret. Essentially, I have, I have more patients who got who got treated. If that is the case, if not, then it's fine. Okay. So I, I'm trying to learn the efficacy of the drug as well as take decisions which have which which also I care about. Okay. Which is that the, the patients get cured or not. So now we are mixing decision making with learning. Okay. Because uh, if I just wanted to learn the efficacy of the drug, I can just you know I don't care about whether somebody died or not, which is bad. But uh, now we care about you know sequentially you know maybe after 100 patients you know what's the situation should I now expose uh, more patients to drug or more patients to control because the drug is not useful so now you care about uh, some other objective as well not just learning okay um, and and so that's going to lead us to uh, what are called multi arm bandit problems and uh, uh, contextual versions of it where there are going to be features present so uh, in the A/B testing problem. Uh, we said, okay, there are two actions or two A and B. Uh, we're going to randomly expose it to users. We're not, we not going to look at the user's uh, features, okay? It's not feature dependent uh, exposure to A or B. In the sense that we want to maintain same features for the two exposed, you know, the two subpopulations. 
uh, but we are not making a decision based on a feature. So the last part is saying uh, based on the feature show A or B, based on the feature maybe even do C or D. So there is a, there's this, uh, I guess, uh, just like supervised learning, which goes from features to labels, here we want to go from features to uh, uh, actions, uh, but in an efficient way, the way I described it here. So let's do one step at a time. So let's look at multi unbinded first. So no feature still, just like A-B testing, we just want to be efficient, you know. Uh, we care about not just learning, but we care about uh, some other outcome, you know, making money, for example, or um, curing more patients as well, okay. So any questions about A-B testing? So that was a very high level idea about A-B testing, mostly because you've already seen hypothesis testing before, okay. So any questions about uh, this part? Okay, so let's uh, look at uh, multi on bandits, okay. So let's first, you know, understand uh, what, is my, what is multiple arms here. Arms are just actions and also let's understand uh, what bandit means. So, So the multi arm bandit problem is as follows, okay. So there's going to be multiple interactions. Um, so there's going to be something sequential, okay. And uh, each, each uh, interaction or each uh, time point in the sequence is going to be a round or an interaction uh, or an interaction or a time index, okay. And uh, what we'll do in each interaction is going to be that we're going to pull an arm, as in uh, we're going to take an action, okay. We're going to either, uh, so in the previous example, we're going to either show website A or website B, okay. So that, that's going to be my action. So that's like pulling an arm. So pulling uh, an arm one means I show website A, pulling an arm uh, two means showing website B to the current user who's at the doorstep, okay, who's, who's, log, who's, who's opened the web page. Okay, and then I immediately uh, get a signal feedback, which is whether they converted, which is they finished the uh, you know checkout process or they did not. Okay, I immediately get a feedback. Okay, so just the terminology has changed. It's a, it's still the same as before. Uh, I had two options, two actions, um, two actions or two websites, right? I didn't know which one is good. I'm going to show. So for the current user, I'm going to show either A or B, which is going to be pulling an arm A or arm B and I'm gonna immediately get some reward, okay? So that's the feedback. And I'm gonna use this feedback to do something intelligent next round, which is to again pull, uh, show A or B. And again, I'm gonna get some feedback. And again, I'm gonna figure out whether to show A or B, okay? Uh, why is it called pulling an arm? Because this is a slot machine. How many of you have played slot machines before? How many of you have not played slot machine? What prevented you from playing slot machines? <laughs> okay, uh, so slot machines have, you know, uh, have, I guess these days they just have buttons, but uh, they also have these uh, arms, okay? You pull the arm and hopefully, you know, these uh, uh, these symbols uh, are aligned and then you get, you know, huge payoff. And to play this, you you pay some initial money, you know, 10 cents or a dollar, and you may get some money or you may not, not get any money, okay? So, uh, so that's pulling an arm. So taking an action is like pulling an arm in the sense that, uh, you know, different slot machines, think of, you know, there are three slot machines here. Maybe there's a 50% uh, chance of you getting back, uh, you know, getting a dollar for every time you play this. Maybe this guy has 30% chance. Uh, maybe this guy has 10% chance. You don't know a priori. You keep pulling the arm. You know, you keep jumping around and maybe pull the arm. And maybe you figure out that this machine is giving you more money. Then you localize on that, okay? So that's like, so these machines are like the websites. You don't know a priori what's the conversion rate uh, for, for any of them. <laughs> And uh, you you show it to people. It's like pulling the arm, and hopefully you figure out which one is a good one. Okay. So let's see. So in general, there's going to be k arms. So by the way, A/B testing is not just restricted to two options. Okay. You can have A/B n testing, which means that you have like ten options, hundred options, and you now have to randomize and randomly put the users across these hundred options. Okay. That's also that's just a simple extension. So here we're just saying capital K arms, or actions, or you know websites, uh, and each correspond to an unknown uh, distribution. By which I mean that uh, there's going to be a distribution mu, okay, it's indexed by k. So for the first website, there's a distribution. Think of a Bernoulli distribution for each website, and uh, so you play the website, you show the website, and the user essentially 
flips a coin with that Bernoulli bias and maybe does the checkout process or doesn't do the checkout process, okay? Or clicks on something or doesn't click on something. So, um, so at each time t, uh, we pick a website to show and we get a reward, which is that they clicked or not. Maybe it's Bernoulli, for example, just, just for us to have an example in our mind. And the objective is to maximize the uh, sum of rewards, okay? In fact, uh, expected sum of rewards, okay? Now, we are attaching a, attaching a distribution to each arm or each action. And when we take that action, we get a stochastic number back, which is the feedback. Maybe it's the money, uh, maybe it's the conversion or not. And we want to maximize the expected sum of these uh, conversions or uh, rewards, okay? Uh, the mean of each arm, let's call it mu k, okay? Uh, it's just the uh, it's just expectation. Think of if it's a Bernoulli, and Bernoulli distribution here, then uh, uh, the mean is just going to be the bias of that Bernoulli, okay? The single parameter, right? And uh, the best arm or the best action or the best website, uh, let's call the, the reward for that guy, uh, the mean reward for that guy is mu star, okay? So far, uh, good. Any questions about the problem setup? Okay. Now, uh, what we're going to do is we need to come up with uh, algorithms, okay? What these algorithms need to do is to incorporate that feedback. So I could always do the following, right? I could uh, ignore the feedback and just do round robin, which means that if I have uh, A, B, just the two websites, just two arms, then I can show A for the first guy, B to the next guy, A for the next guy, third guy, B to the fourth guy, and so on. So odd numbers get shown A, B, <laughs> even numbers get shown B, okay? That's just called round robin uh, fashion or round robin strategy. So we can do that. Or we can do uh, something even worse, which is just show A all the time. <laughs> okay, it's a constant strategy. But uh, whatever be the strategy, okay? Um, so we'll look at some interesting strategies soon. Uh, the way we're gonna evaluate uh, the performance of the strategy is uh, by the notion of what is called a cumulative regret, okay? Cumulative regret, two words. Cumulative just means it's, a, it's, a, it's over time, so if I, uh, if I show it to show it to thousand people, if show the website to thousand people, then I look at the sum over all the feedbacks that I got. Okay, something like that. Uh, so if I show it to thousand people, let's say in a particular, you know, I show it to thousand people. I showed the first website to five hundred people, and then the next website thousand people, uh, next second website to and the next five hundred people. Then I'll get a bunch of rewards, right? So that uh, is the sum of those rewards. Okay, I'm comparing that to the reward that I would, that I would have gotten if I had shown the best website, okay? So if I knew, if I knew how, what's the conversion rate for each website version, okay? Right. Remember this, just think of these as websites. So the, if I knew the conversion rate for the first website is 50%, then I would always show that, right? Because why would I show the uh, second website? Because the conversion rate is only 30%, right? Uh, if I knew, I would always do pick the first one, okay? And the mean reward I get is, uh, mu star in each round uh, in expectation. So n times mu star is the total uh, reward I would have gotten if I knew the conversion rates. I don't know the conversion rates. I did some strategy like round robin or constant or whatever. I got some rewards, okay, uh, over the n periods or n interactions. I'm adding them, adding those rewards up. And uh, I'm just comparing what's the difference between what money I got versus what I would have gotten in expectation if I pulled the best, uh, if I had only shown the best website always, okay. Uh, these, since these Xs are random variables, uh, you take an expectation of this guy, okay, Rn. I mean, this, this is called, uh, uh, so this is a regret. Uh, you take the expectation and it's called the expected cumulative regret or what is called pseudo regret, but just think of it as regret. Regret is just means that if I knew something, I would have done better, but I did something else. My regret is uh, what's the difference between these two numbers, okay? I feel bad that I didn't do the best, okay? Um, so now what you want to do is uh, every every strategy comes with a particular, you know, uh, regret, expected regret, okay? And we want to pick, you know, we would prefer strategies which have low regret, okay? They would do as good as, as if I had known uh, the true, you know, conversion rates beforehand, okay? So that would be uh, the best, uh, but of course, without knowing the numbers, without, without knowing the conversion rates, how do you achieve... Uh, you know, you may not be able to have zero regret, for example, right? If you knew the conversion rates, you would have zero regret because uh, here you'll always pick, uh, here you'll always pick the best arm, best website to show. So every round you, in expectation, you would, you would get um, uh, mu star minus uh, mu star, right? 
so you'd have zero regret so the whole problem is that you don't know the conversion rates therefore you have to learn but when you're learning you also care about rewards that you're getting so you have to balance both reward accumulation and uh, learning about your websites or conversion rates okay so that's the mixing of forecasting and uh, decision making okay if you did not care about regret then you would just spend as you know you 1000 people just to ab testing okay or round robin whatever and you would figure out you would have a good estimate of what's the conversion rate for each website but that's not the end goal the end goal is to you want to figure out conversion conversion rates only because you want to make money so you don't want to spend all your thousand uh, impressions or thousand people on just figuring out the conversion rates you want to make money so that's the uh, regret okay it's make, it's uh, and and you want to take care of regret by taking this feedback into account so after every action that you take you get some information and you make a better decision hopefully next time these strategies are not taking feedback into account these two round robin and constant uh, but we'll look at uh, some strategies which will take feedback into account so far so good is it too laborious <laughs> okay uh, okay so let's look at the first uh, strategy uh, first i guess uh, non trivial strategy uh, it's called the epsilon greedy algorithm okay epsilon greedy strategy and it's uh, pretty uh, simple uh, it's as follows so let's say think of epsilon as like 0.5 okay some number and uh, my strategy is going to be with 0.5 probability i'm going to pick any of the websites at random to show it to people okay what's the purpose of doing that maybe because i show a, a website at random maybe i'll maybe i'll learn okay my focus is going to be on learning okay? because i'm i mean if i just show a website at random i don't care about how much money i make for this you know this round what i show so hopefully i'll learn something and uh, with uh, you know all the i can do something else which is that whatever estimates that i have of how well each of the websites do or each of the arms do okay i'll pick the best among them uh, with uh, you know in, in the in the alternate case uh, in the in other words let's say the algorithm is as follows with probability 50% i pick the best best arm which means that i maintain an estimate mu hat 1 let's say mu hat 2 in the two arms case and uh, I pick one of the uh, the subjectively best one. So we, let's say mu hat one, which is the conversion rate that I have uh, estimated so far. You can estimate that. You can, you showed it to thirty people, fifteen people converted, and fifteen by thirty is your conversion rate for that estimated conversion rate for that website, right? That option. Then I, so if mu hat mu hat one is greater than mu hat two, you show that website with fifty percent probability, or with fifty percent probability, you just randomly pick one of them and show it. When you pick randomly one one of them, I'm just saying that you kind of are focused on learning. Uh, when you show uh, the best one based on information so far you are focused on making money because hopefully the information so far is good and so you're making money if the information was actually good then you should be always be making you know you must be greedy right you should always be uh, picking the one which has the highest uh, you know estimated reward estimated uh, conversion rate right so that's the strategy so the strategy is saying mix both try to learn uh, some, you know with some probability or uh, exploit or you know uh, figure you know subjectively pick the best arm uh, with some other probability okay so this strategy i, I mean just explain uh, uh, yeah is it's like exploit so i guess this is called uh, it's called exploit so exploit just means whatever estimates you have take the best best decision based on the estimates currently you know the decisions are just simple two decisions so it's easy to take the decision if you remember at the very beginning slide, I said if you want to do inventory management or truck routing, even if you had good forecasts of what's going to happen in the in the world, if I route this way, I route that way, routing problem is uh, non-trivial. So there you have too many decisions. Like oh, oh, this truck has to go from A to B to C. This truck can go to you know D, E, and F. So there's a lot of complication. Okay, here is just two is to just uh, take action A or action B. Okay, I just enumerated those actions. Okay, anyway, this is exploitation and this is uh, exploration. Okay, where you just try out a random a random arm. And uh, here's a picture. So let's say the arms are actually Bernoulli. They are essentially conversion rates. So which means that I show website one. So let's say there are five arms, so five websites, five variants. And if I show the first website, uh, the conversion rate is 10%. So one out of 10 people sign up or you know buy the product. And uh, same thing with the next four. And the last one, uh, people really like it. Okay, they will get converted because of you know a lot of information or the way it's presented or whatever. Okay. And uh, on this plot, I'm showing time. Okay, so I have 200, so 250 interactions with users, 
and uh, I am uh, and there are five curves here. Okay. So each curve corresponds to a fixed value of epsilon. So you know the algorithm has a parameter epsilon. I need to pick it beforehand, or I could change it online as well. But let's say I pick it beforehand. Let's say I choose epsilon as uh, 0.5, okay, which was the example from previous slide. Then, so that corresponds to this uh, this this guy over here, okay, the one I highlighted, you know, the purple one or whatever pink one. Uh, so with 0.5. So what are you supposed to do? You're always supposed to pull the fifth, fifth, uh, uh, fifth arm, right? You're always supposed to pull, pull the fifth arm. Now, on the y-axis, I'm showing the probability of selecting the fifth arm. Okay? How often do I select the fifth arm? Okay? So you can imagine if epsilon is 0.5, even if I know the true values, 50% okay, of the time, I'm going to pick the fifth arm, and 50% I'll pick random. Right? That's because epsilon is 0.5, even if I know the true <laughs> estimates, I'll always pick, I'll only pick the best guy 50% of the time, right? But if epsilon is like higher, like in this case, uh, this one corresponds to epsilon is 0.1, then uh, if I know the true values, then I'll pick the best guy 90% of the time. So hopefully, uh, you know, which is what this is, I guess 90% here. And uh, pick the, uh, Yeah, uh, pick the uh, suboptimal arms um, the ten percent of the time. Okay. Now, what we're showing on the so what do, what do these curves represent? Is that at the beginning of time you don't know which one is the best arm. Okay. So the epsilon is actually helping you get estimates, right? Uh, which means that at the beginning of time, you know, like for example, think of the red curve here, the red curve, which is epsilon is point one. At the beginning of time, you don't know which one is the best arm. So with ten percent, you are just randomly trying out different arms just to get better estimates of uh, these numbers, OK? Uh, you don't know these numbers beforehand. And hopefully, as you get more and more, so you you know every round, 10% of the time, you're trying different things. And 90% of the time, you're just trying the best thing that you know so far. Hopefully, over time, you've figured out which one is the best. And therefore, that's the one which is getting picked up most of the time, OK? So that epsilon is equal to 0.1 is really helping you figure out which one is the best, OK? And uh, if epsilon is high, you're actually figuring out which one is the best very quickly. Okay, so this purple or the pink curve is going to 50% uh, or a little bit above 50% very quickly because you've already figured out because epsilon is 0.5, you are really very quickly figuring out. Uh, you know, your focus is on learning, so you're figuring out what are the which is the what are the mean rewards of these Bernoulli uh, feedbacks, okay, conversion rates, and so you have quickly figured out which one is the best. But since epsilon is 0.5, you're even if you know the true numbers, you are you're wasting. You know, you are still exploring. Okay, but the second guy is uh, slowly figuring out and then uh, pulling the best guy uh, more often. Okay, it may look like epsilon point one is better, but what if my time horizon was only uh, fifty rounds? Okay, if my time horizon was only fifty rounds, only up to here, then uh, the uh, pink one is the one which is uh, being at least pulling the best arm a uh, higher number of times, so maybe it'll collect more reward. Okay. So a priori, which epsilon is best is not obvious. Yeah. There's no best epsilon, by the way. Huh? So can we choose the epsilon more smart, more smart section, say by, uh, by finding the gradients of the uh, regrets? Or... So I'm saying How would you know the regret? You don't know the re regret is something no, that I define. So the gradient of the so you only keep estimates. There's no reward function, right? If I try a, try a website, I get some conversion. Whether conversion happened or not, Bernoulli feedback. You could do anything with that Bernoulli feedback. Going up or down? Yeah. Much, yeah. Suddenly... But how do you know what is raising to? Like if I zoom into first twenty rounds, everything is going up, right? Yeah. To find your uh, best arm pretty quickly, right? That's that's what this example is saying. Yes, with this data, yeah, that is true. Yeah, so I think that's what, so. Then your curve is basically yeah. That's a way to yeah, but you don't yeah. That's true. That's true. At that point, shift your epsilon, start increasing your epsilon to a higher. Yeah, yeah, you can adaptively change epsilon if that is what you're saying. Yeah. You could, you could. I didn't say so. This is epsilon greedy with one fixed epsilon 
a priori chosen by the algorithm. You could have an update rule for epsilon as well. That is fine. Okay. Um, that would be some different algorithm. You can figure it out. Maybe maybe people have figured it out. I don't know. Okay. But is the example clear that you have to you have to learn while you earn basically? Okay. Because you care about regret, not just learning uh, estimates, uh, conversion rates. Um, so the next. So what I'm going to do in the next, uh, I guess, a uh, few minutes is uh, look at a little bit two other, little bit more complicated algorithms, only because you know they're kind of popular, have been around like uh, this algorithm called UCB, um, uh, has been there around for like 16 years, uh, and uh, uh, kind of illustrates uh, some, uh, I guess, uh, slightly non-trivial ways of thinking about how how to strategize. Okay, so previous one was pretty simple, like just. Uh, Flip a coin and try learning more about my estimate conversion rates, or just try you know use the estimate so far to figure out uh, you know take the best web, show show the best website so far. That was uh, okay, easy to kind of come up come up with. Uh, the next couple of algorithms uh, they are a little bit non-trivial only because they also come with uh, guarantees. Okay, some guarantees on what's the worst you can do. Okay, uh, I'm talk I'll talk about the guarantees in the next slide. But uh, so the algorithm design. Here is that uh, they're slightly non-trivial, but uh, come with a really good guarantee. Okay, that's the trade-off. So what's uh, what's the strategy? Okay, uh, the strategy has a name: upper confidence bound. Okay, so what does it do? Okay, so it does the following. Uh, so let's focus on this square first, the one I squared up. Okay, it's basically saying after. S rounds, as in S interactions, okay. With uh, after S interactions, uh, average out the rewards that you got for the kth arm. Okay, average the rewards that you got. You know, for example, reward could be convert, not convert, convert. It could be binary binary rewards. It could be something else. You know, money that you made and all that. Just average them out. So that's this average. Okay. Up to this time, and let's call that mu hat. Okay, that's that's the same. So the mu hat is was an object that you also had to keep in epsilon greedy because up to this time I played uh, you know first uh, website uh, you know 30 times, next website uh, 50 times. Then you can uh, keep an average track of how much conversion happened. So that's what mu hat is. It is just uh, uh, laid in symbols. Okay, so it's for the kth arm up to s round. What's the reward? What's the average? What's my uh, running average? Or what's what's my average? Uh, reward for this for this arm. Okay, so that's a simple estimate. Now, what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna take a decision. Okay, we want to figure out which arm to play in this round. I have estimated rewards, estimated average rewards up to previous round of the five websites. Okay, or two websites. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a term which doesn't depend on data. Okay. It depends on how long I have run the experiment for. Maybe I have uh, shown the first website for 20 people, second website to 50 people, which means that I have shown on total 70 people, right? On total for this experiment, I've shown it to 70 people. So that's T, okay, this is 70. I'm gonna add a term which doesn't depend on the data, but it depends on how many people I showed and how many People did I show this particular arm? Okay, so for arm one, maybe since I, I said I showed it to only twenty people, then S is twenty. Okay, and uh, for the second arm, I showed it to fifty people, so S is fifty. But the numerator is the same, two log uh, whatever seventy. Okay, so some correction term that I'm adding. It doesn't depend on the actual reward that I got, but it just tells me that uh, you know for arm one, I showed it to less people, so it's uh, the term is inversely proportional to how how many people I've showed that arm to. So I was just saying that if I've shown that arm, first arm, to only 20 people, there's a there's a bonus term which I'm adding, uh, which is inversely proportional in the sense that if I show it to less people, the term is higher. If I show it to more people, the term is lower. Okay, that's all. Now, this sum sum of a, a sum of the estimate mu hat for the kth arm plus that bonus term is uh, called the upper confidence uh, bound. It's called the upper confidence bound. It's just uh, it's like think of uh, I have an estimate of a mean and I put a confidence interval around it. 
then the mean uh, plus that uh, you know like if i want to ta tag the upper confidence upper bound upper end of the confidence of this confidence interval uh, it's like a mean plus some delta right so that's that's what this resembles okay mean plus some delta okay so that's why it's called upper confidence bound now once you add these bonus terms okay then you take a decision on which arm to pull based on this the added term which one is the whichever one is the highest so it's just saying that you had mean rewards, just add a bonus term which kind of penalizes, which kind of uh, the bonus term is lower if that arm has been pulled a lot of times. And if the arm has not been pulled a lot of times, it's it's higher, okay? And together, whatever the term is, compare it across the two options or the five options that you have, whichever number is, whichever index is the highest, that's the website you're gonna show next, okay? Is the mechanism clear? Prashant, no. So it's like uh, so it's kind of ensuring whether it's, uh, something that has not been shown too long gets shown and yes. then your decision is Yes, yes, yes. So things which are not getting shown, so maybe their uh, mu hats are small, okay? Maybe maybe in the previous example there was 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, and 0 0.9, right? So the 0 0.1 guys, you know, maybe the mu hats corresponding to the 0 0.1 guys are low. But I have not shown them too, too long, I, I want to explore, right? In the previous uh, algorithm, we were flipping a coin epsilon probability, I, I, I was actually showing this 0.1 guys. Here, the bonus term is going to contract and become large, you know, as t is bigger, s term is small compared to the uh, some other arm, then that bonus term is going to ensure that I pull this, pull this. And then if it actually is low, again, you Yeah, can... if it's actually low, then mu hat is going to be still low. But if it's not low, then hopefully I have gotten a better feedback and therefore this number mu hat may be higher and then I'll, I'll hopefully uh, you know keep pulling this arm so mu hat being high also influences that you pull that arm and the bonus term uh, being high also influences you pulling that arm okay anyway which which strategy which strategy works better uh, so, the, so as I said, you know, the next this 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 algorithm you call UCB algorithm, UCB one actually. There are variants just like Adaboos M one, uh, Adaboos something else. So here also there are some names for this, uh, which our researchers gave. But uh, uh, this is as I said, these this algorithm, and the next algorithm I'm going to discuss are slightly complicated, but they come with uh, worst case guarantees that the regret is not going to be too bad. Some this is an English statement, and I'm going to make it precise in the next slide. Uh, these algorithms come with guarantees. Epsilon greedy uh, can fail in some bad settings. Okay. Yeah. In the sense that it may have uh, regret is going to be huge. Yeah. Yeah. So S, what's the S? S is the number of times you showed uh, this particular uh, arm, kth arm, whichever, if you showed it 20 times, then S is 20. And uh, second arm, if you showed 50 times, S is 50. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's a function of k. Yeah, it's a function of k. Yeah, good point. Any other question? Okay, so I was saying that uh, there is a worst case guarantee. Okay, that uh, worst case guarantee is actually this green curve here, and the guarantee is that the you know remember this was a pseudo regret or basically the cumulative regret. Okay, so R N expectation of R N is our cumulative regret. And the guarantee is, so n is going to be the number of rounds, okay? So in, instead of t, I change it to n, but just think of n as the number of rounds, okay? And uh, it's saying that the regret is going to be growing as logarithm uh, will be upper bounded by something times log of n, okay? So that's the guarantee that this, uh, this algorithm, UCB algorithm comes with. So what does it, what does it mean? Why should it be log of n? So remember, if every round I'm completely missing the mark, as in like I'm never pulling the best guy, then I'll always have some difference, right? Instead of, if I never pull the 0.9 guy and always pull point, point 0.1, every round in expectation I have a 0.8 regret. So if I add those things up, it's 0.8 times t, or 0.8 times n, right? That's a cumulative regret. So if I really do bad, which is like, let's say constant strategy, pick the first arm and always play it, and in that example, 0 0.9 and 0 0.9 times minus, 0.1, 0 0.8, 0 0.8 times n would be the regret 
in that case, right? If I if I do the dumb strategy of just always pulling the first arm, right? So therefore, uh, the, for the dumb, dumb strategy, we know that you know the grid is linear in the in the number of times, a uh, number of uh, time steps or n. Okay. Uh, so what we prefer is regret uh, strategies with regret, which has as a, a sublinear dependence on n as possible. Okay. So something like uh, uh, log n or square root n or even one by n, if you can. You know, all those things uh, would be would be preferable because as n increases, the cumulative regret hopefully doesn't uh, increase as uh, the the dumb constant strategy. Okay, so anything which is like uh, uh, expected regret, if it is uh, if it is proportional to order n, it's bad. Okay, anything which sorry, uh, let's call it theta n. So anything which uh, is uh, order n includes you know. Uh, functions which are smaller sublinear functions of n as well, but anyway, so anything like this is bad, and this is a constant strategy. For example, here it's log n, so it's good. Okay, so that's the guarantee that uh, this algorithm comes with. So it's a little bit complicated. We're adding some bonus term, but it tells you that no matter what the in, no matter uh, no matter what the instance is, the instance specific uh, parameters uh, you know are captured by the there's some c in the front. Uh, that takes into account what the whether it's 0 0.1, 0 0.9, 0 0.8, or whatever. So those numbers influence C. But in terms of time horizon, there's a very nice uh, logarithmic dependence on n. Okay. Another way to look at it is what is the instantaneous regret? So after thousand rounds, what is my regret on average? Okay. So I know the cumulative regret. I can divide by n. Okay. Then that will give me the average regret essentially. Remember, if n is thousand. Then uh, this is saying that the average regret is uh, k log n by n. Okay, so log of thousand by thousand, which is like uh, three by thousand. So they're saying that the average regret is low. So as you get more, as you increase n, your regret is like almost nothing. It's as if you're as if you're playing the best arm always, right? On average, your regret is uh, going to zero. Okay. Whereas if it's theta n, then your regret is constant. So every round you're having like 0.8 regret, for example, the constant uh, strategy. Okay. So either your cumulative regret should be something which is which grows sublinearly in n, like something like log n root n n to the power one by four, whatever, or uh, the uh, average regret or the non-cumulative version divided by n, for example, this term, that should uh, go to zero as n increases. Okay. And in this experiment, uh, there are 10 actions or 10 different websites, and uh, these are the mean rewards 0.5 by k. Very, very simple synthetic experiment. And uh, the regret is actually here. Okay, the regret, cumulative regret. I'm adding out all the all the uh, bad things. You know, all the uh, what's the difference between what I'm doing and what's the best thing I could do. Uh, I'm uh, plotting it here, and you can see that regret. Uh, tapers off. You know, it's not linear. For example, it's like a sub, it's like a log function or a square root function, right? In fact, it should be log function. Oh, it doesn't have to be, but whatever. It's uh, it's something which is going down. Okay. Uh, so here on the y-axis is the cumulative regret. Here it's n, and you can see there's a gap between uh, what the algorithm comes with the guarantee. The guarantee is over green curve, and what it actually performed in this particular instance is the lower blue curve. Okay. So that's there's a gap between theoretical guarantee and practical performance, but uh, model of that, I mean, it performs well, okay? Regret being as close to the zero line is, is good, okay? Cumulative regret. So any questions about UCB and uh, what's being shown in this plot? Okay, so let's actually, uh, so K is the number of arms. K is the number of arms. C is the problem dependent constant. Okay, that depends on like remember in the previous example I had 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.9 as the mean rewards of the five arms. So C depends on that on those numbers. Okay, but for us it you know that's some number right? So it's fixed. And it's, it's uh, pretty interesting because you know you're exploiting the statistics. You know you're exploiting 
the statistics and uh, you know this bonus term to ensure that your regret in expectation uh, is going to be low okay so that's a non trivial thing you cannot really eyeball how that is true here you need to spend some time 5 minutes 10 minutes on on this uh, but th that's the so algorithm became slightly non trivial and came with a worst case guarantee not worst case guarantee in expectation it's uh, sublinear okay not the worst case guarantee but okay let's take a break uh, for 5 minutes and resume